Hello, hello. You'll never guess it. This is the very last video lecture of your entire um, high school chemistry career. So we ended with this problem. Hopefully you worked it and you can pull it out and check, see how you did. So here, this, this problem is, is pretty involved and I honestly wouldn't give you this one on the quiz or test because there's a number of different places you could get things messed up to get the wrong answer. But we want to know what's the internal energy change when 53.7 grams of trinitrotoluene, this is, um, this, this is a benzene ring, and with a carbon on it makes it toluene, and then here are three nitro groups, so it's called trinitrotoluene, and it's a pretty big explosive. Um, it's, um, it takes a lot to detonate it. You can melt it, which is one of it, the, the reasons people... Uh, the military likes is you could melt it down and make different shapes of it because uh, it melts at like 86 degrees Celsius, very similar to like sugar, um, and then you can mold it. But what makes it an explosive, as we've already talked about, um, it can do a whole lot of work. And it's it stems from looking over here, we have solid reactants. And then when you look at the products, we have three moles of nitrogen gas, five moles of hydrogen gas, 12 moles of carbon monoxide gas and we that means we have 20 moles of gas being produced and we would definitely say that this reaction is doing some work um so it is expanding can it that that's what where that's explosive force comes from is this massive expansion of matter that's going to push everything in all different directions now at the same time um, it's very, very exothermic. So here is our enthalpy change of 3,400 kilojoules per mole being released, and it can reach temperatures up to 3,500 Kelvin. So we want to calculate what is the total change in internal energy. Now, previously, we ended by talking about how if you look at normal reactions, the amount of work being done compared to the heat is relatively minor. But the big exception is, well, if you have things that explode, again, if they're producing large quantities of gas, well, then it starts to become more substantial, the work component. And so what we want to do is look at those together. So we have, this is our internal energy. It's the enthalpy minus the pressure times the increase in volume. And so we could we could do this, but we said we in a previous problem we looked at how the delta v the p delta v it'll be easier to exchange it out for p v equals n r t. So delta n is how many moles of gas we've increased, and it's twenty. And then r is just a constant, and our temperature is thirty five hundred kelvin. Now in reality, that temperature would not be constant. Um, but we have to, we're going to just use this one value. So there's going to be two components. We need to figure out um, this amount of work being done, but then we also need to figure out delta H. So you might be tempted to say, oh, delta H equals 3,400 kilojoules per mole. So just plug it in here. But that is per mole. We need to know it's 53.7 grams. So again, we had worked a similar problem that's going to look like this. So 53.7 grams of TNT. So we divide by its molar mass, which was given to get moles. And then we can say for every two moles of TNT, because we can see up here, since the coefficient is two, then this value is two. So two moles of TNT release 3,400 kilojoules of energy. So with that, we then can figure out that it releases negative 402 kilojoules of energy. So that is our delta H. So then our at delta N, we plug everything else in. So here's the uh, NRT, 20 moles. Here's um, R, 3,500 Kelvin. And I've also divided by 1,000 because it was this was in joules. So to put it in kilojoules, uh, we need this. Uh, 580 or the positive 582 kilojoules. So now it's delta H, the enthalpy minus the work component, and collectively we get this huge value of negative 984 um, 
So that is a very large um, release of energy, and it's because it's both exothermic and it's doing work on the system. <clears throat> so you can expect on the quiz and the test, though, you would have you would have two separate problems, like one where you're calculating the enthalpy, like you're seeing here, and then one where you're calculating the work, where you would see here. Uh, but then I do want you to know that, yeah, collectively they're just added together. So then the, ne the next thing we're going to look at is um, now I might tell you, you might hear that, oh, it releases 984 kilojoules. But what does that really mean to you? Um, again, we know it's a unit of energy, but, you know, we're, we're, if we're saying it's releasing energy, you could probably have an idea that, oh, it's going to feel hot because it's releasing thermal energy. But how hot would it get? To figure that out, we look at what's called specific heat. And, and again, heat is thermal energy transfer specific heat tells us what is the temperature change for one gram of a substance so not all materials heat up in the same way you probably know that if you put an empty pot or a pan on a on the stove top then within 30 seconds of being heating you're not going to want to touch that metal metals heat up really really quickly however if you fill it up with water you know, after five minutes, you can still put your hand in a pot of water that's heating because water has a much, much higher specific heat. So these are experimentally determined values that tell you how much energy, how many joules of energy does it take to heat up one gram, one Celsius. Um, and so you can look at some of these values and you could pretty much for any substance look up a specific heat. Uh, now, there's a couple trends I want you to know that are listed here. So first off, we know that metals are good thermal conductors. Uh, they transfer heat easily. And we can see that aluminum 0.9, gold 0.129, lead 0.1, mercury 0.1. Metals have characteristically low specific heats. So they heat up and they also cool down rapidly. So I mentioned you could put it on the stovetop. And it would get really it would get hot fast but if you took it off it will quickly cool down in contrast if you look at water water has a high value of four it's like 40 times greater than some of these other ones like lead and mercury and so with a larger specific heat it takes more energy to heat up but at the same time it takes a lot longer to cool off so you boil some water take it off the stovetop it's still going to be hot five minutes later where the pan by itself would not. Now, this technically we, um, comes down to molecular uh, motion. So when it comes to metals, they have a, a lattice. And when you heat them up, all they can really do is vibrate more or less. But and, and that that translates to temperature. But when you heat up water or other molecules, molecules tend to have larger specific heats because they have a whole lot of other modes of motion where it can absorb energy to do these sorts of uh, weird dances, move, moves, but it, those don't necessarily relate to temperature. Um, now, if we're talking about one specific uh, substance or a, of a given key thing here is a given quantity. Uh, then we might talk about its heat capacity. Now, you might say that a piece of iron is dense. Uh, density is an intensive property. Now, if it was an iron block, you'd be like, oh yeah, it's heavy. But if I asked you to pip up, pick up a paper clip, you wouldn't say an iron paper clip is heavy, but it technically its density doesn't change. Well, in the same way, Specific heat is the intensive property where it's per gram. Heat capacity um, is the specific heat times, so it's the specific heat times the mass. So for a given, um, for a given something, it will have a finite number of joules it takes to heat it up one degree Celsius. So the magic equation we're going to be using a lot for the rest for, for a, a lot today is Q, which is heat, is equal to mass times specific heat, which again we can look up in a table times the change in temperature. Or if we know again, if we're if we know the heat capacity, again instead of mass times specific heat, 
heat capacity is the extensive version, just like kind of like weight. What what mass is to density, heat capacity is to specific heat. So that heat capacity times change in temperature, both of us tell, tell these how much heat was exchanged. So we're going to be using this equation a lot. On the quiz and test, this is one that we posted at the beginning because you'll need to use it. So let's say we take 466 grams of water and we want to heat it up from eight and a half to 74.6 degrees Celsius. So if we do that, we measure the water in, in the pot. We want to know, well, how much energy, how much thermal energy was given off by the stove in kilojoules? So what we're going to do is we're going to look up on the reference table what we know about water and it has a specific heat of 4.184 joules per gram Celsius. Um, and our change in temperature, it's always final minus initial. So it went up positive 66.1 degrees. And now using our magic equation, the mass of water was 466. Here's our specific heat of water. And here's our change in temperature. So collectively, we can find that it was 1.29 times 10 to the fifth joules, or that is 129 kilojoules. Now, this is not the, the final answer. So one thing, this is, this is what's going to be called calorimetry. We're tr in calorimetry, you're trying to figure out how much energy is stored in something or how much energy was used. So the fact that this was positive, a positive 129, is it was absorbed. We want to know how much heat was given off by the stove. So while the water gave off 100 and, or absorbed 129 kilojoules, we can then say the stove released 129 kilojoules. So from this little burner, it's negative 129 kilojoules uh, that says that it gave it off um, and the water absorbed it. So I want you to look at... Okay, so as I mentioned, this is a technique called calorimetry where we're going to be very careful in measuring temperature changes um, in a reaction, typically in an isolated system, so that we can then calculate what the heat changes are. So one big theme um, in calorimetry is there's going to be, I should have, a, I don't have a mouse, so I'm using a trackpad, yep, that was, that's an R. Um, I'm spelling work. Do you see see this work? There's there's going to be no work in calorimetry. Oh, that looks ugly. Let's get rid of that. Um, so calorimetry is all about measuring heat changes. So enthalpy, um, thermal energy changes in physical or chemical processes. So there's a couple different types. This is called a bomb calorimeter. Now, if you think of a bomb, it's a reaction that goes off in, an ice, in a constant volume where pressure builds up and goes boom. Um, this isn't typically going to do that, but it, is, it does have a constant volume. And that, that's exactly the reason why, remember, with, with constant volume, no work can be done. Work can only happen if there's an expansion um, or compression. Uh, this is also an isolated system. So by saying it's isolated, again, it's insulated so that no energy can escape or leave. And so collectively, the heat of the system is equal to the heat change in water, the bomb, the reaction. And so since this thing is isolated, the overall heat of the system, this whole thing is zero. And so we're going to use this, that whatever the heat of our reaction is, the heat of the water and bomb will be reflected with a negative value. So some reaction goes off, if it releases energy, if, if the reaction's exothermic, then it is encased in water and there's a thermometer that can measure the, the increase in temperature. So if it's an increase in temperature, we know that this reaction's exothermic. If the, react, if the water temperature goes down, we know the reaction um, absorbed energy and we would see uh, we would expect a positive uh, Q, but whatever the heat of the reaction is, it should have an opposite sign to what we measure for the water and the bomb. Now, many times if, you, if you're using a calorimeter, when you buy it, it would all, instead of tell it measuring out the mass of water, 
it would tell you to put in a specific amount of water and it will just give you a heat capacity for the entire bomb. That way you just need to measure the temperature and plug in a number and then that you have the heat capacity of this whole thing. So those are your standards. And I should say that I mentioned enthalpy a second ago, but because the pressure is not technically constant, this is not enthalpy, uh, we can still use Q. Or, so it's the heat of reaction, but not technically enthalpy of reaction. So let's imagine we put a small amount, 1.4 grams of naphthalene. This is the stuff you find in mothballs. If you've ever smelt mothballs, it's, it's, it has a strong smell. So you ignite it, it combusts, and it raises the temperature of the water from 20.2 to 25.9 degrees Celsius. Now, we're, it goes ahead and tells us the heat capacity of the bomb plus the water, the, cal the whole calorimeter unit, is 10.17 kilojoules per Celsius. What is the molar heat of combustion? So we're using this equation that the heat of our calorimeter is the heat capacity which we're told times the change in temperature which is given. So final minus initial 57.66. Now this is po a positive value so as the temperature goes up, we expect a positive value because that is the energy absorbed. But what you need to remember for calorimetry is if that is what is absorbed, it's because it's given off by the combustion. So the heat of combustion is negative 57.66 kilojoules. So if this is the amount absorbed, it's because that same amount is given off. Now, if this question said, what is the heat of combustion? without this whole molar part, we would be done. But because it says molar heat of combustion, we want to put it as how many kilojoules per mole. So all you have to do is convert 1.4 grams of naphthalene to moles of naphthalene and use this to divide it by that number of moles. And so here it is um, divided by the, the, the energy divided by per gram and then converting to moles using the molar mass. Again, I think you can go from grams to moles. So now we can say it's negative 5,000 kilojoules of energy per mole when naphthalene is combusted. This calorimetry is the technique that's used to measure the energy content of your food. So if you're talking about how many calories are in your potato chips, your Doritos, your cookies, then when you see the food label and it says 120 calories, it was measured using calorimetry. Um, so glucose, it releases negative 2,800 kilojoules per mole, uh, and that's whether you burn it or digest it. Again, despite different pathways, the same amount of energy is stored, you know, is stored in that chemical energy or allowing it to be released. Now, I do need to mention that when you see calories on a label, they're technically kilocalories. So capital C calorie is a thousand little tiny calories, and that's equal to 4,184 joules or 4.184 kilojoules. So if this number looks familiar, it's because 4.184 was the specific heat of water. So technically, one calorie is the amount of energy needed to heat one gram of water up one degree Celsius. Um, and so when we look at different foods, we find, again, you, you probably know there's more calories in butter and cheese because they have a lot more fat versus apple, which is mostly complex carbs uh, versus protein and beef. And so here it's showing it instead of calories in um, enthalpy, the heat of combustions and again you're still seeing that the same trends so it greater instead of kilojoules uh, we're just more used to see it in calories now another type of calorimeter is a constant pressure calorimeter now this is the type that we would have used done in a lab had we you know actually had class easily made with two styrofoam cups that serve as an insulator but because it's not a perfect isolated system um, instead of constant volume, it's constant pressure because it's the air pressure is exposed to it to help keep it relatively constant. Now, we are going to say that it's isolated in the sense that the insulation makes allows no heat to enter or leave. 
Um, and still, so we're going to still say that the heat of reaction is the opposite of the water and the calorimeter. So this is the same as before. Now, because it is constant pressure, we do get to call this enthalpy because that, that's the only distinction is that constant pressure, we can call it enthalpy change. And so this is how we can then find heats of neutralization, ionization, heats, all different sorts of heats of reaction similar to what we just did. Let's work some of those problems. It doesn't have to technically even be a reaction. So here, this is, if you heat up a piece of lead to almost 90 degrees Celsius, and then you dunk it in the water, you know that the lead is going to cool off, but the water is going to heat up until they both reach the same temperature. So if we record the measurement of water going up from 25 to 23, 22 to 23 degrees Celsius, what is the specific heat of lead? So again, this is how we could experimentally determine these values. So what we would do is we, again, we, we know they're both going to reach the same temperature. And we know that the heat of the lead and the water together have to add up to zero. So the heat of the lead has the opposite heat of the water. So first, we're going to figure out, well, what was the heat of water? So the mass of water was 100. The specific heat of water is given. And we measure the delta T. It went up 0.67. So collectively, we can say the heat of water absorbed was, it went up 280 joules. Now we're trying to figure out the specific heat of lead. So if water gains 280, it's because lead gave off 280. So then we know the mass of lead we put in. We know the change in temperature. It went from 90 down to 23 and the heat we calculated. And so then we have a specific heat of 0.15, which is relatively low compared to water. And we said we know that because that's typical of metals and good thermal conductors. Here's another calorimetry problem, but this time instead of a looking for specific heat, we want to know what is the heat of neutralization for a, um, that is an acid and base reaction. So we're taking equal amounts of equal concentrated hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. And if you pour them together, this is one of the dangers of pouring concentrated acid and base together. It's strongly exothermic, and so the solution can heat up pretty quickly. But these are fairly dilute. So we measure the temperature rising 22 and a half up to 25 degrees Celsius. What is the molar heat change? Again, we could also call this the molar enthalpy change or just heat of reaction. Now, to make life, our lives easier, we're going to assume the densities of these aqueous solutions are equal to water and that their heat capacity uh, and the specific heat of water is not um, changed uh, very much. So those values are going to stay the same. So we're first going to find, to find the heat of reaction, we need to find what was the heat of solution and take the negative. So the mass of the water, we had... 200 milliliters and at one gram per milliliter that's going to make 200 grams of solution right here this is just in scientific notation for fun times the specific heat of water times the delta t and we find that the solution absorbed 2.81 kilojoules well if the solution gains that much it's because the reaction gave off that much so then if we want to know what's the heat of reaction, it's negative 2.8 kilojoules. But if we want to know what's the molar heat of reaction, we just need to know, well, what is kilojoules per mole? So each of them were 0.5 molar. So molarity times volume gives moles. So we had 0 0.05 moles of each of them. So taking our heat of neutralization, dividing it by the mole quantity, we get negative 56 kilojoules per mole for this heat of neutralization. So here's where I would ask you to, hey, you should work this one. So if you'd like the challenge, you can hit pause and see if you're able to work it out. Um, and then when you're done, unpause and I'm about to go over the answer. So a piece of sodium metal is put into water and produces sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas.
it is exothermic. This is a redox. It's sodium getting oxidized, hydrogen getting reduced. Um, and we find that uh, we're going to find that the temperature increases. So we want to know what is the expected final temperature of water. Again, we're going to make some fun assumptions like the density and specific heat of water will go unchanged when adding the sodium. We're also going to assume all thermal energy is absorbed by the water um, and we're excluding any that would be absorbed by sodium hydroxide, which it should it would be pretty negligible. So we're starting with our 24 to 0.5 degrees Celsius water and we want to know in 250 milliliters how hot could be expected to reach. So we're going to first need to calculate what is the enthalpy change, which we'll do that uh, from, some, we, from a calculation to, that we've done before. And then we're going to use the specific heat equation, M or Q is equal to MS delta T. So we convert our grams to moles, and we've done that before. Then we use the fact that two moles of sodium release negative 367 kilojoules to find the heat of the heat of this reaction is negative 42.9 kilojoules now this gets released into the solution so that means if that's the heat of reaction the solution absorbs 42.9 kilojoules so now using our fancy equation the heat of solution is positive 42.9 the mass of water is going to be 250 grams because water is one gram per milliliter. We know the specific heat of water is 4.184, uh, and that's in joules. So to get kilojoules, we divide by a thousand, and so we use this to calculate our delta T. So we get a delta T of positive 41 degrees Celsius. So then, if we want to know what's the final temperature, if we start at 24.5 and we go up 41. That we could expect a final temperature of 65.5 degrees Celsius. There you go. Now the last, the last um, collection of problems is going to be taking advantage of Hess's law. Now Hess's law pretty much just talks about is pretty much summarizes quantitatively state functions. So a state function, remember, does not depend on the pathway taken. It doesn't matter how many steps. All that matters is where you start and where you finish. And so enthalpy is a state function. And if we were to look at the enthalpy of sublimation, that is to go straight from a solid to a gas without any melting, what you could do is first find what's the heat of fusion, which is melting. Then you could find the heat of vaporization. So you could look up these. And to calculate the heat of sublimation, you just add the two together. So 6 plus 40.8 is 46.8. So this is Hess's law. Just the change in enthalpy does not matter whether it's a one-step or multi-step reaction. Uh, and it's we're going to see the same thing. That's what, going back to, we I mentioned with the calorimetry for food labels, whether you burn a piece of food to draw out energy or you let the body metabolize it over 30 plus reactions the same energy the same enthalpy changes are going to occur now we can use this in what's called the born haber cycle to determine lattice energy now lattice energy we said in chapter 9 was the energy needed to completely vaporize a solid ionic compound to a gaseous state but that's you cannot directly measure that. So instead, what you have to do is rely on Hess's law. So this diagram here is showing, um, here's lithium fluoride, and here is the lithium and fluoride ion gases. So again, what you can't do is go from this to this, or at least it's very, very difficult to do experimentally. But what you can do is you can measure the reaction of lithium and fluorine to make lithium fluoride. And so here, that overall reaction is neg almost negative 600 kilojoules. You can also measure the energy it takes to cause diatomic fluorine to dissociate. And that's right here. 
you can measure the energy it needs to sublimate lithium right here and then ionize both lithium and fluoride. And so if you can measure all of these other ones, then you can set up a nice table that looks like this. Now that looks horrible because going from PowerPoint to Google Slides, I guess it stretched it or something. Oh, that looks bad. You can look in the book for this, uh, but it's just showing each one of these individual steps with the only one that's not known or that can't be measured directly is this lattice energy. And so if we can measure the overall reaction and we also have sublimation and ionization, dissociation, then all we have to do is plug in all of them and then we can find this, this unknown lattice energy. And so going back to chapter nine, that's how we came up with these values for lattice energy of magnesium oxide versus magnesium chloride, etc. Now you're in luck. I'm not going to, besides asking a concept question, I'm not going to ask you to do the math on these because they can be kind of confusing with all these numbers. Um, some chemistry professors in college do have you do this, but I'm super nice. I've had former students send, ask, send me emails about these uh, for help. And I guess if you find yourself doing them in college, send me an email. I'll help you too. Um, heat of solution. So it, where lattice energy is the energy to separate an ionic compound. Heat of solution is the enthalpy associated with dissolving. So dissolution of a solid into generally water. It's sometimes also called heat of hydration if we're talking about water, which we normally are. So there's two things that have to happen. The solute has to break apart and the water has to break hydrogen bonds. And then they have then there's they form ion dipole forces, which are stabilizing. So there's this first step that breaks things apart. That's going to require and take energy. But then when the ions and water come together, that is stabilizing and it's going to release energy. And to measure the overall heat of solution, it's just a sum of the. So using Hess's law, we can see it takes 788 kilojoules of energy to break all the ionic bonds. That's the lattice energy. But the heat of hydration, which is, again, when the ion dipole forces are made, then that releases. There's a negative 784 kilojoules. So adding them together, we get a net positive four kilojoules worth of energy per mole. Um, and so you don't notice this, but when you, you don't typically notice this, but technically when you dissolve table salt into water, it slightly increases the temperature because it's, it's releasing this energy into the water. Um, and so here are some other compounds now. So more noticeably, if you dissolve calcium chloride into water, um, this negative 82 is going to make it even hotter. Oh, and I, I said that backwards. So it's positive four. So because it takes an, it, it, it takes energy, it's going to make it slightly cooler. Now, ammonium nitrate being, again, almost nine times, eight to nine times larger, if you dissolve ammonium nitrate in water, it gets cold. And that's the stuff that's used in instant ice packs because it has this positive heat of solution where negative heats of solution release energy and will make the water hotter. So the very last thing in this chapter is calculating using standard state conditions enthalpy. One. So standard state refers to measuring enthalpies compared to other references. Um, and it's always going to be at one atmosphere and typically 25 degrees Celsius. So you're going to hear the standard enthalpy of formation, also called standard heat of formation. And it's going to have this uh, superscripted zero. Sometimes you'll hear it called delta H naught. Um, and this is the heat change when one mole of compound is formed from its elements at the one atmosphere. Now, it is important to know that we are arbitrarily setting every neutral element in its um, most stable form to zero. So at 25 degrees Celsius, not in a compound, 
how it would be naturally found on the periodic table or found in nature um, in its neutral state. So if we say, hey, what about the O2, the oxygen you're breathing? Zero kilojoules. What's the standard heat of formation of graphite? Carbon, zero kilojoules. What about a piece of iron, solid iron, zero kilojoules? So what we do then is we measure everything in comparison to this. So what I mean by that is if the value is greater, more positive, it's going to refer to having being at a more energetic state than the elements. Or if it's negative, it's in a more stable uh, state than the elements. So for example, ozone is an allotrope of oxygen, but it's less stable. That's why it's not nearly as common. But to take ozone, oxygen to ozone, it requires 140 kilojoules of energy. So a positive value. So again, what we're going to be interested in is the difference of these heats of formation. Now, on the other hand, a more stable form of oxygen is oxide. You know, oxygen is sharing two electrons here, but what it would rather do is have two electrons all on its own. So in oxide, it's not having to share. So for oxygen to gain two electrons, it can release 140 kilojoules. And so oxide is more stable than oxygen, which is more stable than ozone. Um, and so what we're going to be interested in is the differences in these heats of formation. So graphite is the most stable form of carbon, but diamonds uh, again, but also made of carbon is less stable, uh, at least thermodynamically. And I know the properties, like physical properties, we might say diamonds are more stable. But in terms of stability, chemical stability, diamonds are higher. So it requires 1.9 kilojoules to go from graphite to diamond. Now, what do most elements like to do? Most of them don't like staying by themselves. A lot of them form compounds. So while oxygen and carbon both might both be zero by themselves, when they form carbon dioxide, then there's this huge change to negative 393. And so that's what's typical is that compounds are going to have negative values because they are formed because they're stable, able to stabilize, um, stabilize these elements. So iron here is a solid, but another way we could go to a more energetic form is we could liquefy it. So if you heat up iron until it's molten, it has a positive 12.4 kilojoule value. So the standard heat of formation of iron liquid is higher than <coughs> solid iron. Now, what does iron tend to do? It tends to rust. And so when iron oxidizes to iron two, again, it's going to a more stable form. So by definition, the most stable neutral form of every element is zero and if it goes to a higher energy state it's positive if it goes to a a more stable form it'll be negative negative. and these are we're, so we're going to look up tables of these experimentally measured values and then we're going to use them to compare so again what, what i want you to think of this is it's almost like altitude so if you're in Northwest Arkansas, you're sitting at close to 1,100 feet altitude. Now, that 1,100 feet is relative to sea level. So we are 1,100 feet above sea level. But why, why at sea level? Why couldn't we have chose the top of Mount Everest to be zero? Or why, at the, why not the bottom of the Marianas Trench? And so we've arbitrarily set altitude at zero at sea level. So in the same way, we're setting each, that's a misspelled neutral right there. We're setting each neutral element to zero. And then depending on whether a compound is more or less stable, it looks at the enthalpy change to go up or down. And so here's a short table. You can also look in the back of the book at appendix three, um, or you can probably just Google thermodynamics standard state data to find all sorts of information. But we're going to use these standard heats of, of formation to then determine the standard enthalpy or heat of reaction. So if calorimetry allows us to experimentally measure uh, 
uh, heat changes, then this is going to how we make predictions about what the heat changes are. And so here's this big complicated looking equation, uh, but really all it's saying is if you look up the heat of formation of the products, multiply them by their coefficients, and then subtract the reactants, then you have what we call the standard enthalpy of reaction or standard heat of reaction. So this is the form I'll give it to you where again, this symbol here, sigma, just means adding them up. So add up all the products, add up all the reactants and subtract. Again, this is just showing Hess's law that it doesn't matter, you know, all that matters is what you end up with and what you started with. So it doesn't matter how many intermediate steps there were, it's just beginning and end. So here is thermite. So we're going to look at the heat of formations for iron, aluminum oxide, iron oxide, and aluminum. Um, and then we can calculate the heat of reaction. So thermite's not something you'd want to put in a calorimeter because it would probably melt through the calorimeter. It can reach thousands of degrees and um, can produce molten iron. So we're already given the heat of, the heat of formation for iron, uh, liquid iron, again, if it was solid, it'd be zero, but liquid iron is 12. Now we could already say aluminum is zero, but then we have to go and look up the values for iron and aluminum oxide. Now, because aluminum and iron have coefficients of two, they're both multiplied by two. But since aluminum and iron oxide have coefficients of one, there's just multiplied by one. So you go and look up the values and aluminum oxide is this plus two times 12 minus, again, here's the reactants, aluminum we knew was zero and we get negative 822. Again, this is very, very, very exothermic. Now at this point in class, this is where I would uh, pause and say, okay, now it's your turn. So here is the exploding pumpkin and it has acetylene in it combusting. And I'd want you to calculate what is the standard heat of reaction given these values for acetylene, oxygen, CO2, and water. So as like we said before, um, if you'd like to practice this and so you could pat yourself on the back, pause the video now, because in a few moments, I'm going to go over the answer. So with these values, you just need to know that you take the product CO2, and you multiply it by four because that's its coefficient. You take the heat of react the formation for water, you multiply it by two because that's its coefficient, and then you subtract the value for oxygen, which is zero, and acetylene, but multiplied by two because it has a coefficient of two. And you should end up with negative 2,600 kilojoules. Now, we can also use this uh, to look at intermediate reactions, like instead of going from carbon and oxygen to CO2, um, there's also sometimes an intermediate reaction where carbon and oxygen form carbon monoxide instead of dioxide. And so we find if it takes 393 kilojoules to go from C to CO2, um, and we could use our direct method this way, this is the indirect method we could measure, we could see that it takes 110 kilojoules to go from carbon to carbon, carbon monoxide. So then if we wanted to know, if we know it took 110 kilojoules to go add one oxygen and 390 to add both, we could then use subtraction to figure out that it takes 283 kilojoules to go from carbon monoxide to dioxide. So again, Hess's law, whether it takes one step or two steps, it's the same enthalpy change. Now, I won't give this one to you on the quiz or test, but you can also use this to take other reaction types to calculate, um, to, to calculate new standard heats of reaction. So if we know these three reactions and we want to get, what about graphite, hydrogen to make acetylene? What we need to do is rearrange these three reactions so that they add up to this one given. So what I mean by that is if we look at graphite in A, 
In this reaction, there's two of them, so we multiply everything by two, which means we double this heat of reaction. Um, hydrogen H2 to H2 is exactly the same, so we can leave that alone. But if we look at C, there's two acetylenes, but over here, there's only one in the products. So to make this mirror what's up here, we're going to reverse it and divide it by two. So when you reverse it, the sign changes from negative to positive, and then we cut it in half. So at this point, if we add them all together, everything equals out except for what we are left wanting, graphite and hydrogen making acetylene. So then we can just add these numbers together to get the heat of reaction. Now, I want, to, I want you to know that most of the time, if a reaction is going to be spontaneous, it usually lowers the energy state, meaning it's typically going to be spontaneous. Like looking at these two skiers, which one of these would you believe would be spontaneous? The one going down the slope or the one going up? And you would know it's the one going down. But sometimes we have endothermic reactions like ice melting, ammonium nitrate dissolving, uh, photosynthesis, it has to take in energy. Any endo, So we know there are sp not spontaneous endothermic reactions. So to explain this, there's another thermodynamic factor called entropy. And entropy is this big old concept on its own that we don't have time to talk about, but if you take College Chem 2, you will. But it is a way of looking at all of the different ways energy and matter can be disordered. So if, if you look at these two, we would say the one on the right has much higher entropy because the, the beans are more chaotic and disordered, where this one would have lower entropy. Now, if you were to shake both of these, which one would you feel is going to naturally stay the same and which one is going to change? So entropy is it tends to happen. So this one would stay with higher entropy and the one with lower entropy, if you shook it, it would naturally gravitate to higher entropy. And so one thing we find is that any reaction that can increase the randomness um, is also going to be a driving force. So together these that combine to determine whether something is spontaneous enough or not. And this, this and um, entropy is dependent on temperature. So this is actually one of the reasons why, you know, you can look at water freezing to a solid um, and the phase, phase changes have to happen at a certain temperature. It's because as the temperature goes up or down, it then changes how much entropy is actually affecting it. Because if you add the enthalpy with the entropy value, it gives you Gibbs free energy. And for a reaction to be spontaneous, it has to have a negative value, which means, again, when delta H is negative, if it's exothermic, then that favors spontaneity. And then when entropy increases, because this is a negative value, it favors spontaneity. So um, the big thing I want you to know in this slide is that a spontaneous, most spontaneous reactions are going to be favored by exothermic reactions and increasing entropy. Uh, one, one easy way to make entropy go up is to give off gases, because gases by nature are more entropic than solids, than liquids. So this brings about the end of this class. Um, and if you want to learn more about Gibbs free ent energy and entropy, you can go to chapter 17. Uh, and here's a really neat video you should watch about entropy that's played backwards, and it's just kind of neat. But anyway, we got quizzes coming up, tests coming up, and eventually a final exam. So email me if you have any questions.